Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today. I am Jennifer Joyce, uh, Regional Vice President for Sales for the West here at Conducive Technologies and here with me today I have my partner in crime, Howard Butler. Uh, he is the Senior Director of Systems Engineering. Uh, Howard is a 30 plus year veteran of Conducive and an expert in the inner workings of the Windows operating system. So uh, Howard, thank you for joining us today. Hey, thanks Jennifer, really glad to be here. Hey everyone, don't, don't let her title fool you. As uh, Jennifer's been with the company a little more than a decade and I think is quite technical as well. So with one particular housekeeping item though, I would like to uh, indicate that this is going to be a, a rather lively interactive type of webcast. So guys, feel free to drop in your questions in the Q&A box and we'll get to them as we go along or we'll definitely answer them uh, towards the, the end if, if there's time for that. So uh, Jennifer, thanks very much for inviting me. Yeah, thanks for being here, Howard. And uh, one other housekeeping item here real quick is we're going to do this in two parts as far as the webinar goes. The first section is going to be an executive briefing. We're going to use that time to focus on uh, some use cases. And then the second part is going to be the technical briefing of, you know, how we do what we do. Uh, so let's cover the agenda real quick. Um, so we're just going to talk a little bit about the landscape. Uh, the subject today is VDI. How do we optimize it? How do we look at doubling uh, VDI density on the hardware you already have uh, while increasing performance? We've got five specific use cases uh, that we're going to review with you. And then we're going to talk about how to evaluate. And as I mentioned, then we'll go into the last part of the technical briefing and technical Q&A. So definitely drop your questions in. And just to kind of get things started, um, I, as I kind of go over this, I would like to, you know, if you guys could just start dropping into the chat box real quick. Um, if you're using VDI currently, maybe just type yes and maybe how many concurrent sessions you run. Uh, that'd be pretty interesting to see. So we kind of understand our audience here a little bit. Uh, but just so that we understand Conducive a little bit, some of you may be new to Conducive, uh, not familiar with this at all. So I'm just going to spend a, a quick minute, uh, not too much time. I'll keep this real high level, but we are a 39 year old software company. Um, and that kind of my running joke on this is that I'm trying to convert that into dog years, into software years, but I, I haven't found the calculator on that yet. So if anyone knows how to do that conversion, let me know. Um, but I do want to mention that we are the 12th oldest software company still in existence in the world. Uh, and just a couple of what I like to call our scout badges. Uh, specifically, we are a Microsoft Gold partner, have been since day one. And we also um, have had access to the Microsoft operating system source code. We are just one of a handful of companies who have ever had uh, that insight. And it's part of why we can do what we do because of that deep level understanding of the operating system that we have. Uh, and then we also are a VMware TAP partner uh, and we've recently had our Citrix Ready certification. So kind of uh, hitting right in there in the space of the, the hypervisors that are really working with VDI. Okay, so we're going to jump right into kind of setting the table of what's happening today with the VDI space. Uh, we're all familiar with the S curve of product adoption. And when something hits kind of that 90% market saturation, it's considered to be at full maturity. A lot of products never make it there. We don't know how long it's going to take. Um, you know, we've got products that have gone obsolete. You know, I was going to put a horse and buggy in, but I think the Model T Ford covers it. Um, we've got stuff that, uh, you know, I was actually just at my uh, my grandmother's house last weekend and she had some VHS tapes in her house. Uh, so they're not totally out the door yet, but they're pretty much gone. And uh, we've got some other technologies. Now, hard disk drives, we're probably at about a 80% adoption rate of SSDs in most client environments. So uh, that's still present, but not necessarily so prevalent. Um, then we come into things that are at full maturity. We've got tiered storage, um, we've got, you know, individual client machines, all flash storage and virtualization. And it's kind of neat being here at Conducive because we really are in the catbird seat with what we do. It's it's almost a Gartner-like view into what's trending in IT because we talk with so many different companies every week uh, from small to medium businesses to the largest enterprises in the world. And it's because of what we do, where we sit right at the top of the stack within the Windows operating system that we get that kind of a view. So, you know, virtualization, for example, we got to witness that spread across the landscape back in that 2009 2000 time heavy adoption time frame uh, you know we saw when it was just planning stages very quickly went to 75 percent adoption and for a long time now we've been at 99 percent adoption now the new growers are really cloud vdi and hyper converged and there's challenges in all of these uh, cloud for example we have seen 
Um, a lot of golf course conversations happening around cloud, but a lot of people haven't migrated their entire enterprise out to the cloud yet. And we've seen those that have boomerang back and build back out full data centers because of the cost performance equation isn't balancing there. Um, with VDI, we're seeing some very similar challenges, and we, we've seen a lot of early adopters, but still really low on the growth curve. Typically, the early adopters have been in the healthcare seg uh, space. A um, couple of other verticals, maybe state and local government and call centers have been where we've seen a lot of VDI adoption, but again, not without its cost challenges and some questions on TCO. So we'll get into that a little bit more as well. Um, but what we have right now in our current environment is a hyper acceleration of VDI adoption because of the mass migration to home offices. So uh, in my opinion, we were very low in that growth curve at the beginning of January, and now we are in a hyper accelerated state where people are really scrambling to make this happen. So let's talk about the benefits of VDI real quick. I think we're all pretty familiar with what those benefits probably are. Um, but we have, you know, just basically greater mobility and productivity, improved data security, and just streamlining of IT management and central image management. And then you can also get away with much cheaper lower endpoints, uh, but you still have the cost to bear on the, uh, the hardware on the server side. So some of the barriers, uh, VDI can be quite complex. And as I just mentioned, the cost, uh, it's quite high. It also has a high degree of difficulty when it comes to deploying it, managing it, and it requires an extensive amount of internal in-house expertise to maintain and run that properly and really manage that image and that end user experience. And a lot of times it's also an adoption issue of the end users resisting because they feel like their performance was better when they had a physical dedicated uh, client on, sitting on their desk, they could hug and, you know, talk nicely to. Um, so the problem is that up until now, TCO was really often higher than dedicated endpoints when you take all of that overhead and operating cost and, and capital X layout to get it to work. Uh, it just wasn't viable or feasible. The other thing too is the amount, and this goes back to the subject and theme of our webinar today, is the amount of hardware it takes to keep performance high is uh, quite, uh, quite a lot. Um, so we're really at a point where because of the current environment and, and people adopting the home use, uh, home office type environments, VDI adoption and remote desktop services really are here to stay. This is all gonna normalize. And one of the biggest points that I wanna make about this is really the fact that part of that ROI cost is that I think that a lot of companies are gonna realize that they don't have to maintain the cost of all that real estate for uh, all of those seats. And once you can get rid of the real estate plus the expensive endpoints uh, and go to a VDI environment, in fact, people just pretty much using their own home computers to log in to work a lot of cases, um, it really does start to make sense on the financial side. So we're really gonna see this accelerate. We already have actually, we're getting calls on this already, which is why we're hosting this webinar series. So wanna just jump right in here to um, uh, some recent recommendations that were given to one of our customers. Uh, they are a customer of ours using us on their entire data center on their server side. And they have a VDI environment that they were struggling with a bit and they were looking to, they were advised that they were gonna have to cut their density in half as they upgraded to Windows 10. And they had already taken a 20 to 30% hit in performance, uh, 18, 24, I think it's been more than 24 months ago now when the Spectre meltdown patches came out. Uh, so they're looking at having to get twice the hardware to keep the performance going. Um, they went to the publisher of their tier one application that they're running, it's a hospital environment, and they asked for guidelines on how they could improve their throughput metrics and not have to decrease the VDI density so drastically. And the recommendations they got back uh, were kind of interesting. <laughs> it was, okay, add hardware and assess everything in the image. Um, and we found that to not be that helpful. It was kind of funny actually, because we we're trying to avoid adding hardware. And when you assess everything in the image, you really only have two options. Traditionally, you can either uh, recode applications, which we know isn't gonna happen, haha, -ha, or you can strip some applications out of your image and they're in your image for a reason. You've already deemed them necessary to run your, your business. So as the customer and I were having this conversation, it kind of popped in some, just popped out of my mouth and I said, you know, the Windows OS is in the image. And we both started laughing and he goes, you know, you're right. And he's like, yeah, I already know what you do for our servers. You're improving 30 to 40% throughput on our server environment. And it would make sense that it's Windows is Windows, whether it's server or VDI, let's look at this for our VDI environment as well. And we have our, you know, our partnerships, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in these three spaces. Now, the first 
chart. This is our first use case. This is this. I want to jump into our use cases here real quick. Uh, introduction. I think we've covered kind of what the scene is. Um, so for our first use case, this is a chart with just some of the test results uh, because the full charts and data that we had are just too much for a webinar. But this is uh, one of the results that we had when we did our Citrix Ready certification. Uh, we used Iometer benchmarks and we were running this on a Windows 10 system running in Citrix Zen Desktop BDA. Uh, and then we have the side-by-sides with Velocity and without. Now with Velocity, transaction rates increased by over 90%. Uh, it, one of the use cases we're looking at IOPS increasing from 2,900 up to 5,500. Uh, and, and all we're changing here is putting velocity in and out. No other changes were made. Um, and we have also, you know, with velocity and diameter running on the same benchmarks in the same amount of time, we were able to increase the workload from 169 gigs to 273 gigs, around a 60% increase. So we're looking at some pretty, pretty impressive throughput numbers here. And that's where we're coming at with being able to increase your VDI density in your, in your environment. Now, I want to real quick discuss what I would like to term the two IO fallacies, right? The first one is the IOPS fallacy, and then the next one is the IO response time fallacy. So let's talk about the IOPS fallacy first. First, what is the myth? The myth is that I have more than enough IOPS to handle the workload. Uh, maybe I've got an all flash SAN. Um, I've got, you know, 600,000 IOPS on it, which is actually a real use case that we had. Uh, it was very, very interesting um, on this one particular work use case that, that I went through, uh, they had a all flash pure SAN, 600,000 IOPS, um, and this was a server POC we did. They only had 11 physical servers attached to it because the workloads were so heavy and they were really missing their SLAs. Their data warehouse server, we were able to shave the overnight job in half from seven hours to three and a half, and we were able to shave about 15 minutes off their SQL workload, which got them under their SLA. Um, so it's kind of an interesting thing to look at. So when we look at the reality of this, Workloads are processing 30 to 40% slower than they need to be due to, and you're going to hear this theme a couple of times, the nature or the way the I.O. is structured when it gets issued from Windows. So Windows is creating a data pattern of small, split, and random I.O.s. That's generated directly by Windows. Now, a point here is that sequential I.O., always, 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 always outperforms random I.O. on any hardware that you want to run tests on. So that's going to be very interesting. So when we look at that and we want to look at what's the truth of the situation, only a small percentage of the total I.O. capacity is being used at any one time, right? For example, um, if I walk into a crowded room and let's say the room has 20 foot ceilings, and this, this room is packed, I, there's shoulder to shoulder. And someone comes in and says, okay, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to walk from this side of the room to that side of the room and not touch anybody else. This message will self-destruct in five seconds, right? I'm not gonna be able to pull that off, even though I've got 15 feet of clear airspace above me, because I have to use the working space down here where everyone's standing in that five to six feet of space. So that's a really good analogy for when we have over-provisioned hardware, we're looking at, hey, I've got these huge IOPS ratings. Uh, it doesn't really matter. What we want to look at is the 3% of the IOPS you are using. We can make that 3% go 30 to 40% faster. The rest of it's just a distraction. So that's what we really want to focus our attention on. And what happens is with those high IOPS ratings and all that headroom is we get this false sense of security um, because of all of that, that rating. Uh, and what we're really losing is when the way the Windows is designed and sends data out, it really is sapping 30 to 40% of the throughput potential out of that hardware, and we can give that back to you. So that's, that's the first um, uh, IO fallacy. So the other thing that we want to look at then is what is that second IO fallacy, and that is the IO response time fallacy. Okay, now this one's really interesting. We can really get misled by IO response time. We like to look at, well, let's take a look at the myth here. We like to look at the sub millisecond response times on individual IOs. And that also gives us a false sense of security because we think that faster IO response time is better. That is not always the case, right? So let's look at the reality. One individual smaller I.O. transfers faster than one individual larger I.O. So if you had like a, a 4K I.O. versus a 64K I.O. and you time them, 64K is going to take longer. The other thing this doesn't factor into play 
is that it doesn't take into account the, the configuration of the I.O. You have split I.O. versus contiguous I.O. You also have random I.O. versus sequential I.O. And all three of these factors play in significantly. So that's what we really want to look at. And the truth of the matter is that the individual response time of each I.O. is really over-prioritized when we're looking and analyzing what our throughput is. It's important, yes, and having flash is a wonderful thing, but it has been over-prioritized because of this missing of what's the nature of the I.O. And the overall throughput is always going to be slower when data is transferred with small split random I.O., and it's always going to be faster when it's transferred with contiguous larger sequential I.O. And we're going to get into here shortly exactly how velocity transforms I.O. at the source within the Windows operating system so that we get the contiguous larger sequential I.O. that gives you 30 to 40 percent faster throughput. We're also going to talk about how this is optimized, this optimization work is done while lowering resource consumption on a system, lowering CPU utilization, things like that. And that's going to be coming up in these use cases that we're going to jump into right now. So Howard, let's uh, let's go into the actual next use case, keep this moving along here. I think that's what people really want to see is show me the numbers, right? So the second use case um, can you elaborate on this a little bit? And I think that this is the perfect use case as well to really cover a, a good example on this IO response time fallacy. So I'm going to bring up this next slide for you, Howard. All right, sure, Jennifer. Thanks very much. So guys, let's take a quick look at what IO transformation with velocity can do. So we're going to go through these slides kind of quickly. So I recommend you kind of buckle up, pay attention here. Um, but the nice thing is that we can validate this with third-party tools, like you probably already have in your environment, like VROPS, vSphere. Um, you know, VROPS was what was used in this particular hospital case. Um, the orange lines indicate what the measurements were with velocity. And as you can see, a pretty nice trend of improvement on write requests per second. So Jennifer, let's go to the next slide. And we can elaborate a little bit more here. I think I was so, taking you too far. There you go. Okay, yeah. So I'm kind of scratching my head there for a second here, huh? Kind of what's up with this write latency? Okay, but consider this. If this was the only metric you were looking at, you'd probably walk away with a feeling that velocity was actually slowing things down a bit because the write latency was a bit longer. And this kind of ties back to what Jennifer was talking about with regard to IO response time myth. So let's take a look at what happens in the NETS metric, the next slide. So hold on a second here, wait a minute. We take a look now and we're seeing the write rate actually shoots up through the roof. Look how much more kilobytes per second is actually being transferred, okay? Now, obviously, if we go back to the previous slide, Jennifer, okay, so now we can see kind of the right latency, and sometimes the latency is up to three times longer. But Jennifer, if we now go back to the next slide, okay, thanks, we can kind of see the throughput metric has improved anywhere from two to six times. So you're actually getting more work, more throughput being done. Uh, and this really goes to tie into the power of focusing on throughput rather than, you know, IOs per second or some other uh, less important type of, of measurement. So, you know, I don't want to over-focus on, on individual IOs response time. And if we can take a look now, Jennifer, at the next use case. Okay, fantastic. So here we're kind of looking at read latency. Okay, and again, it looks like it's gotten much worse. But when we take a look at what's really happening, okay, in the next slide, we can see that the read rate is just off the charts. So again, you're doing more work getting more data transactions completed and not having to really be focused that much on individual response time. It's really about a factor of work. So Jennifer, if we go on to the next slide, 
and we can see this just talks about disk usage. And I think the picture kind of speaks for itself. And let me mention that, you know, this isn't really about user experience, okay? Of course, it may always come down to that, but why do you have your VDI density count set the way it currently is? And that's really because of, of user and user experience. So when you install Velocity, it's really not valid to go back and ask your users if they've noticed anything is faster because you've already managed or optimized the user experience by scaling down your VDI density to meet the necessary requirements. But I believe when you install Velocity, you could actually scale up your actual VDI um, instances and still keep the user experience within an optimum or acceptable range, just simply by looking at this throughput. Now, Jennifer, if we go on to the next slide, and I just want to touch on one more point here, and that is, you know, how important it is about the concept of IO transformation. And, you know, I'll go into a little bit deeper technical detail a little bit further on in the briefing here, but just look at this, this slide, and you can kind of see from a high level to kind of sum it up. What we want to have happen to these IOs, these right IOs, we want them to be larger. So you're transferring more data in the same IO packet. But when you're looking at this, and you see these really small random type of IOs occurring, that's incurring an extra 30 to 40 percent more work for your storage system to do. Whereas if what should occur and the way in which Windows can handle it, if we could take the foot off of the brake, because essentially that's what Windows is doing. It's putting, putting the brakes on your nice, fast Maserati. So think of velocity as pressing down on the accelerator and making things more streamlined, faster, and giving you greater throughput. So let's take a look at another use case. Great. Now, we aren't going to spend a lot of time on this one. It's a, you know, a horizon environment. It's using an all pure flash type storage. And again, we tested using VROPS. And these numbers are from a Fortune 500 company. In fact, you'd probably recognize it as a household cable TV company. Um, but these were sampling, samplings taken from their call center. And you can see the data usage rate is significantly better, more than double in most cases, with velocity than without. Jennifer, if we skip to the next slide, great. So take a look at commands per second. It too has significantly improved, again, more than double in most cases. And here we go again with the average number of write requests. We can see that across the board, every system has realized a very significant increase in productivity, in their activity. And with the write rate measured in kilobytes per second, this too also shows the average number of kilobytes written to the disk each, each second. So we can see that across the board, every system has realized a significant increase in activity. Naturally, this would tie back to velocity, transforming those split random IOs into larger, more contiguous and sequential type of data streams. And here we have the read IO kilobyte rate, showing the average number of kilobyte reads from the disk each second. And we can also realize a significant increase in activity here. Okay, so I've got two more cases here I wanna kind of quickly go through, and then we can jump into a technical briefing. But just wrapping up this one, in fact, one of our partners did a POC and brought the results to us and to the customer. And the conclusion was the net result was that Velocity would be able to allow them to double the number of VDI clients in their environment. And under some conditions, possibly five times more if they were just to add a little bit more DRAM 
to, to the uh, host environment itself. And that's a much better approach uh, than over-purchasing and buying more physical host to support that increase. So let's take a, num a look at the numbers real quick on the next slide here. And we have a clear, a near identical number of systems. But notice that there was a decrease in the CPU usage, but yet with greater amount of activity. Now, memory did go up, but it's memory that was free, idle, unused. That would have been wasted anyway. It's a resource that we can put into play in a very dynamic way, such that we can allow more throughput to occur. You know, in this dynamic use of memory, just a small portion of memory can help get things moving faster. And here's that fifth and final case. This was tested on a fairly large Citrix terminal server environment where it's been load balanced. The customer was testing using vSphere in this particular case. They sent the data back to us and we concluded that it would have, would have a 32% improvement in reads and an 18% improvement in writes. So that's very substantial. So I think that, Jennifer, that kind of wraps up the use case here. And I hope, you know, these type of, of classic documented type cases have been very helpful, uh, both to you and, and the listeners there. So Jennifer, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Thanks a lot, Howard, and thanks for taking us through that. Uh, it's great to be able to share this kind of information with everybody today. And now we're gonna go ahead and talk really briefly about how you can evaluate the software in your own environment, and then we'll get into the technical how we do it. Uh, and thanks everybody for your responses on your utilization of VDI. Um, and I also saw a bunch of questions about um, can we get a recording? Absolutely. The session is being recorded. And to that end, if you need to drop off for another obligation, we will send you the recording. You can pick it up and finish watching it. But we're going to dive into that technical part right now. And if you do have questions as we go, drop them into the Q&A box. I've got my eye on that box. And we can probably field questions as we go or hit them right at the end of the Q&A session. Um, so getting your hands on the software, basically, we would set up a pre-POC consultation call with you, understand what your use case is, what your environment is like, what types of tools you have at your disposal, and recommend uh, the proof of concept. Most VDI proof of concepts are done in under two weeks, same with server proof of concepts. Um, and we would then have a review of the results that you've achieved. Um, and then, you know, we can go from there. The types of things that you can expect to get out of the software, you've already heard alluded to, but increased VM density, extended hardware life cycle, only having to buy eight pounds of hardware instead of 10 pounds of hardware, better performance in general, uh, reduced timeouts and crashes, especially when you get into the SQL world. And again, remember the software applies for all windows, not just VDI. Um, so this is kind of the steps we would take you through of customizing your plan. Not gonna spend any time on this, but uh, we do have a formalized process that's very streamlined that we'll take you through for that. Now let's jump into the technical briefing because I'm sure a bunch of you guys are like, great, that's all good, but exactly how do you do it? Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start covering that real quick. So I realized that this, um, this is a rudimentary extraction of what a virtualized environment would look like, but I think it's, you know, giving a pretty clear takeaway here that as great as virtualization has been for server efficiency, one of the biggest downsides to virtualization is that it does add complexity to the data path. This is what the IO stream ends up looking like. And this is where we were talking about that split small random IO, that unhealthy stream that's very difficult to process. So you've got, you know, kind of the options we talked about, throw more hardware at it, try to rewrite code, which isn't going to happen, um, you know, premature, uh, upgrades and also over provisioning is very, very common. But are we, what are we really getting out of that over provisioning? Because again, we want to look at the space that's being used. We can get that to run 30 to 40% faster. So there's a use case that, um, that I want to discuss real quick. So there's really two problems here. You can see them labeled out. There's the Windows IO tax and the IO blender effect. The Windows IO tax is how Windows is sending that data out so inefficiently. It's just designed to. Uh, for example, if you had a 64K file inbound into the Windows operating system, it is going to not know the size of that file. That's a very important piece of data that's missing. 
And so what it will do is it will go and look for the first available free space, and it'll do that by looking for the lowest logical cluster number that's open. It will grab it and start writing that file logically. We're talking logically at Windows NTFS, not, not down at the SAN at this point. So if that first available free space is 4K in space, it's going to use it. Take it, write that 4K, split the I.O., and go look for the next lowest LCN. Start writing data. Maybe that's 8K contiguous. Drop that in split it and rinse and repeat until the whole thing's committed. That's how we get that small split IO that then randomizes. We want to avoid that and our software does prevent that from happening. Um, the second level of problem is this IO blunder effect. So once you fix it at one VM, that's great for that one VM, but then you have this universal problem. A really great example of this uh, that happened with the proof of concept that we did uh, last fall, actually we did it last spring and summer and they purchased it last fall, um, was on a SQL farm. They had six hosts with 120 SQL VMs isolated there. I'm sure it was because of Microsoft licensing costs, they did that. And they had one server, like in this example, where they were supporting one customer and they were missing an SLA on that one server. They were, And they said, can we just deploy to that one server and get the result? And we said, you can deploy to the one server, you're going to clean that one server up. But once you hit the IO Blender effect, that benefit's going to get suppressed. And that's exactly what happened. They didn't start making the SLA. Round two, they gave us their 10 busiest servers in that cluster. They made the SLA for the first time in over a year by three minutes. And they were having to pay a very big penalty back to that customer every month they missed that SLA. It was an extremely expensive problem. Then in the third month, they removed Velocity, missed the SLA by five minutes. And in the fourth month, they put Velocity back out there and um, on 119 of their 120 VMs and they made the SLA by 17 minutes. Now, due to their change control and the timing of the SLA that happened to be a very long POC, you can wrap this whole thing up in two weeks. But it was a clear, clear, clear example of that IO Blender effect. And this is what it looks like when you deploy velocity to everything. And that's gonna be the same case that we just witnessed in uh, the, the use cases we just reviewed for VDI. A rising tide raises all ships. Now, I wanna just touch briefly on where the software sits, right? So once you're able to kind of transform the IO, the, the point of transforming the IO is to do it here at the source. So the orange bar is where Velocity is installed. It is a 100% software solution. There are no hardware components to deal with. It really comprises and consists of two light filter drivers. It's fenced by the Windows operating system and only talks to Windows. So compatibility is paramount, right? You want to make sure that anything you're putting in the environment is going to play well with the other kids in the sandbox. We are fenced by Windows and we're completely compatible with Windows. Everything else in the environment has to be compatible with Windows as well. If you think about it, there's not a, you know, a flavor of Windows for Pure or a Windows for VMware or a Windows for NetApp. It just doesn't happen. Everyone is compatible with Windows, as are we, so we're good to go there. Now, the most important part of the concept of this slide is the title of the slide, top of the stack. We are dealing with the source versus the symptoms. This is where it becomes so important to transform the I.O. that Windows is issuing from small fractured randomized I.O to large, fewer sequential I.O. And that's where you're gonna get that 30 to 40% throughput boost and be able to support more VDI clients on the same environment. So let's take a look here real quick um, at what we do. Uh, the two engines, the first engine is write optimization. It does the I.O. transformation. The second engine is our DRAM read caching engine where we utilize memory. And then we also have pretty good reporting in our velocity management console uh, deployment. It's a .msi. You can put it right into your gold image of your VDI environment. You're good to go. And then you can get reporting back through the console after the fact. So it's very nice, uh, nice level of management and reporting. Now, the right I.O. reduction uh, engine is called Intel. Right. And I realize I'm going through this pretty quickly, so if there's questions, please drop them into that question box. And of course, when we do our one-on-one -on -one consultations with you, we can answer a lot more questions in depth. Uh, but here, the right I.O. And, uh, reduction um, software and the really what I would like to probably rename this slide to the I.O. transformation slide. Um, but this is where we are feeding that missing piece of data I mentioned earlier, the size of the file. We're feeding that information to Windows. And we're saying, hey, Windows, this is a 64K file. And the good news is we don't have to buffer the file to figure out the size. Our algorithms heuristically know that this file type tends to be this size. So we're not 100% on the size correct every time, but we're close enough. 95% of the time, we will prevent all of the split I.O. and get Windows to transform that file and have the intelligence to just go ahead and write it contiguously the first time. That results in a 30% reduction on average of write I.O. being issued by Windows. 
that's huge. It normally takes an average of 100,000 IOs to 150,000 IOs to write one gig of data. So using that 100,000 benchmark, when Velocity is installed, we can reduce that down to 70,000 IOs because we transformed the IO to larger sequential IO. It's literally the same data. It's just carpooled now. It's going through the carpool lane, which increases your throughput. That's huge. Keep in mind that how it writes is how it reads. So when you get that 30% reduction in because of the IO transformation from the writes, when it goes to read back, it's already in that optimized state and you're going to get the faster read back as well. Now to layer on top of that read optimization, not only is it writing clean, reading clean, but we also then enter in our second filter driver in telememory. This is DRAM read caching. You could consider this to be our tier zero cache strategy. And just to be very, very clear, it's the only place we're using memory. On the write engines, we are not buffering any of those writes. Those are all passed through. Windows is in complete control. We get that question a lot. Uh, so just to save someone from having to type it in. Um, yeah, we you won't lose any data or anything like that in the case of a power outage because the only place we're using memory is in IntelliMemory and we're caching reads. Now, the real genius of this engine is that it is completely dynamic. It is only borrowing free memory that would otherwise be sitting there unused, which Howard alluded to earlier. And it does not take a lot of memory. Now, in the VDI space, a lot of people, what we're talking to right now, have eight gigs in their image. In fact, I'm kind of curious if you guys could drop into the into the uh, environment, how many gigs you have on your image for your VDI clients. It used to be four. A lot of people have eight. We just got off the phone with someone this morning that has 16. Um, so kind of let us know what you've got there. And I see someone just, uh, Mark just popped in that he's got four which is great. In fact, the use cases, the two use cases we reviewed with VROPS, both had four gigs of memory, highly effective. So when you have eight, you have more than you need to be effective with our software. Um, so it's highly dynamic, very effective, and this engine offloads another 20 to 30% of all IO. Now, Howard, I would like to ask you really briefly to touch on on that, what I was talking about, about the dynamic aspect of our memory utilization, if you wouldn't mind just touching on this for just a quick second. Sure, thanks very much, Jennifer. So guys, here's a little bit about the secret sauce, you know, in, in our solution set here. And uh, thanks, Philip, for asking the question about whether or not a reboot is needed. No reboot is needed uh, to install our software. Uh, that's something rather unique we've been able to, to uh, work with and figure out. But this is an animated visual of how Velocity can dynamically adjust the memory usage so that way it's only using free and available idle memory for its cache, memory that would otherwise just be unused anyway. And it's also intelligent enough to, to know when there's a demand for memory and when there is, release memory out of our cache and give it back to Windows. So there's never going to be a shortage of free memory and that'll keep Windows happy and other applications happy and satisfying. We can kind of ebb and flow with the availability of memory to dynamically adjust the size of our cache to meet the current demands. Thank you, Howard. And I want to bring up one more thing. We're on the home stretch, guys, so we've got about two slides left. And uh, so if you do have any technical questions, now's the time to drop them in. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and get to this technical recommendation by VMware because uh, I know a lot of folks are running Horizon. So the interesting thing is that this is directly from VMware's uh, per disk performance uh, enhancement advice documents. And the first one says, and I'm just going to highlight uh, the concept here, is that it says increase the virtual machine memory. This should allow for the operating system to do more caching, which would off off offload I.O. from the subsystems. Okay, well, let's talk about that. We all know that that we have plenty of memory and the OS isn't using it. So that's not really going to benefit with the OS being able to use that. But what they're basically saying is leverage the memory to cache as much as you can for reads from that level. And that's exactly what our software does on an enterprise class level. We literally cache 20 to 30 percent of the hot, repetitive, tiny, small, noisy read I.O. And it's those tiny, small IOs that are getting in the way and slowing things down. And by the way, when you do leverage the memory from that level, memory to memory data transfers are gonna be 12 to 15 times faster than going down to your flash layer in your SAN. So you're getting faster service on those read requests and you're removing all of that IO from having to go down to the storage, freeing up that 
remember the only the only part of that that whole bandwidth equation that we care about is the three percent you're using so get that three percent get it out of the way so the rest of the io can go faster and remember the rest of the io has also been sequentialized so that's pretty important that we can do that recommendation the second one defragment the file systems on all guests okay well guess what guys Fra what fragmentation is is i kind of think of this as like uh, uh the child story of uh you know the egg sitting on the wall it breaks and then all these King's men have to come in and, and put this thing back together. And it's very labor intensive to fix the problem once it's happened. What we're doing with our software is we're not letting the egg fall and break in the first place. So the recommendation to defragment the file systems on all guests, again, the takeaway from that is that we want to make sure that you're getting large sequential read and write IOs. In fact, I got a chance to meet with uh, some people at VMware in person uh, last fall. Uh, up in San Francisco, and we talked about this, and we're working on some joint uh, joint publications about these recommendations and how our software addresses these recommendations. So very, very interesting that the, these two recommendations are exactly met by our software at an enterprise class level with a twist. Uh, very interesting indeed. So this is what our UI looks like. From the UI, you're going to be able to see reporting about the IOs eliminated and transformed, the storage IO saved, the free space is consolidated. You're going to get some additional um, system by system reporting that we can do some analysis on. And uh, that is kind of it. So again, um, I'm starting to see a couple of questions pop in. We're going to take those questions. When we get to the last question, we will be ending the webinar. So if you're holding on to a question, now's the time to type it in. And uh, we'll go ahead and go to the Q&A right now. So, um, the questions I believe we've already answered. Yes, we will. We are recording the session. We will be sending the session out. Uh, you'll have a full recording, no problem. And what is the tax to allocate? Howard, this question's for you. What is the tax to allocate, deallocate memory from Sean? Howard, you got uh, audio? Oh, can you guys hear me? If, if we have audio, can you drop in it? Yes, okay, great. So we've lost Howard, so I'll go ahead and answer these questions. Um, Howard owes me a Starbucks. We have a, we have a running joke. If he's on mute uh, when it's his turn to talk, he owes me a Starbucks. So uh, it's gonna be a good one since it happened on a webinar. All right, so what is the tax to allocate, deallocate memory? Okay, so as far as allocating, deallocating memory, Sean, that's gonna depend on what you're referring to. So for example, um, uh, I mean, you might be talking about resource utilization, so let me answer it two different ways. So there is no um, CPU overhead or additional overhead to do this. Our software runs on a, a software called Invisi uh, Tasking. There's another engine we haven't talked about today. Invisi Tasking looks at uh, things like disk queue length, um, CPU utilization, memory utilization, and it will only allow our optimization work to be done on idle system resources that are otherwise not being used. So yes, of course, we do have to use some resources to do our work, but we do it with a zero overhead impact. As you even saw on one of the use cases where we reduced CPU utilization on that environment with 325 BDI clients concurrently running, we reduced the CPU utilization on that environment by a full 5%. Uh, so we definitely don't uh, hog resources and we use them very cautiously and conservatively. So Sean, if you could drop in, if that answered your question, that would be fantastic. Um, if there's another uh, aspect. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so now Igor's got, does Velocity run on the host OS or on each guest OS? So Igor, the Velocity runs on the host, oh, I mean, excuse me, not on the host, it runs within each guest. And it does not matter what the host is because we are Windows only. So someone may think, well, if, if it's Windows only, what about Hyper-V would you install on that host? Technically we can install on the host, but we've done it and we've benchmarked the improvements. And most cases we don't see the benefit of installing there. So we are gonna focus just on the, the individual guest VMs, whether they're server or VDI. Um, Stephen Brown's got a question. Does Velocity work for large sequential IO on physical desktop, no VDI for us? Yes, absolutely, 100%. It can be benchmarked, we can show that to you. Um, we've got uh, Americo says, do you have a maximum, maximum estimate of benefit cost versus improvement? Um, so that's gonna be obviously case by case. We do work with you individually to do an ROI. Um, it's really gonna, a lot of it depends on your VDI density or your server density. How many hosts can you avoid buying another host at 20K plus all the operating and software licensing that comes with that and the manpower to you know stand it up and all of that. So um, 
there is, we certainly can do a cost benefit analysis, TCO, ROI for your particular use case. And of course, if that doesn't make sense, don't get the software. If it does make sense, get it. Um, I hope that answered your question. If not, please uh, drop in some clarifications. Uh, Mike, is the benefit the same with linked versus full clones? Yes, it is. Um, and Michael has, will the improved throughput statistics be reflected in the SANS performance charts as well? Michael, that is a fantastic question. Uh, I really like that question. Yes, it will. And I have behind the scenes in sitting in my various folders stored on uh, my OneDrive and in my Outlook, a lot of different uh, instances that people have sent me their SAN measurements. So when we benchmark with the SAN, we do want to validate your, your testing. And here's the reason. Your SAN might have a thousand servers tied back to it or 4,000 VDI clients tied back to it. If we just do a proof of concept and deploy to 90 of 1,000 VDI clients, we're not going to see the benefit because it's a drop in the bucket. We're not optimizing everything all at once. So it's not all that often that we do a proof of concept where we, we deploy to the entire environment universally. We have had opportunities to do it, and I do have those results sitting in the back ground I can uh, share with you when we do a one-on-one -on -one consultation. Uh, but that is a really good point when we're doing your evaluation. And this is one of the reasons we want to validate your, your test plans is that we want to look at um, the VMs themselves. We can use Perfmon, uh, vSphere, vRops, Stell Live Optics. You know, uh, we've had people do it with SolarWinds, things like that. Uh, but you definitely want to point directly at the VMs because if you're just going to do it, let's say, on 90 VDI clients, you've got a thousand sitting there. You can then extrapolate and say, okay, if I got this benefit on 90 using these tools, then I can do the force multiplier out to what it would do for my entire environment. Most people, once they buy it, they don't bother to then go and benchmark because they've already seen the benchmarking and they've decided to buy it. So um, that's the answer there. Sorry for a little longer answer, but that answers it. Um, and Sean says, okay, I'm down to the last question. So if anybody had any more questions, do let me know. But Sean says, how does disk formatting offset effect velocities performance SQL Server, for example? Sean, I do not know the answer to that. I am not an engineer. I just play one on webinars. I'm kidding. Um, but uh, that would really actually be a Howard question. So I will go ahead and ask uh, Howard to follow up with you directly after the webinar. And okay, guys, so that is a wrap. I really appreciate all of the questions. I hope I've done a, a reasonable uh, facsimile of an impression of an SE answering those. And uh, I will look forward to speaking with you or my counterparts will, uh, whoever you end up scheduling your one-on-one scheduling your -on -one consultation with. Uh, but you can expect to hear from Katie uh, Gregory, who's on our team, to go ahead and uh, schedule that appointment for you. And you're welcome, Mark. And thank you, everyone, for joining. It was a great webinar. I had a lot of fun. Looking forward to speaking with each of you one-on-one. -on -one.